disturbed or upset by depictions of terrifying graphic violence, hallucinogenic drug use, punk rock orgies, and nihilistic existentialism, you should not see the Theta Girl. If, on the other hand, you enjoy such depictions of frank graphic adult material, this is the film for you. The Theta Girl. Welcome to the Film Strap Podcast. I am Chris Gore, joined as always by Anthony Ray Bench. How's it going? My co-host yeah. of the Hi. Film Thread Podcast. And we are here, we're here to talk about uh, talk to the director uh, Chris Bickle of Theta Girl. We're also here a, a quick quick before we uh, have Chris join us on the show. I want to let you know, you know, if you want your movie reviewed by Film Thread, you can just send us your movie. It's really it's, it's true. that easy. It's that easy. I feel see now. I feel like I'm doing some <laughs> bad Ronco commercial, some bad late night TV show commercial. And I'm just going with it. I know all this information. Right. Let's right. just pretend you're telling me right, for the first right. time. Yeah. Did you know this could solve your problem? But no. Look, uh, we get pitched a lot of movies by publicists. A lot of movies um, we're interested in, and then some movies maybe a lot more we're not interested in. But what um, I, I think the reason that film threat needs to exist, there needs to be a film threat is because there are filmmakers located all over the world that do work that don't have publicists, that don't have that kind of media savvy. And you know what? All you can do, you just go to filmthreat.com, go straight to the bottom of film threat, and there you see a little button that says submit. Click on submit. Submit as your project. This is how we find out. This is how we find out about a lot of films. I think this is how we found out actually about the Theta Girl, which we're going to talk about uh, with Chris Bickle. Who's on the line right now? He's on the let's line right now. Let's get into it. Let's let's get into it. Welcome to the Film Threat Podcast, Chris Bickle. Hey guys, what's up? Hey, let's um, imagine that there was glorious applause. Actually, <laughs> I can edit that. Actually, in. okay. You know what? There was glorious applause. It was I heard it. One of the largest crowds giving applause ever. Chris, okay, this is one of those is one of those rare treats where you never know what you're going to get when people are submitting films uh, to Film Threat. And when something like the Theta Girl comes along, that's just something that makes me smile. What I mean, in your thinking in making this thing, um, you, you know, what was your thinking in sending it to us? Just at the beginning. Well, well, I tell you, um, Film Threat was a really big deal to me when I was in college, and that was a long time ago. And so I wanted to be a filmmaker in college, and I, I was studying film, and I sort of got distracted from it. My life took a different track. And then uh, I got a little bit older and realized I hadn't done the one thing that I really wanted to do my entire life, and maybe I might die soon. So, so well, I decided I, I wanted not. to... Yeah, right. Well, you, you know, you, you get up you in age and, and these, these thoughts occur to you, right? So uh, so we made this movie. And um, so when I found out Film Threat was, was still an entity uh, in, you know, Internet land, uh, of course, like that was like one of the first things, you know, we got to send it to Film Threat. And getting that review back from Film Threat that was like a pretty glowing review was like – I felt like I'd made it, <laughs> in a way, like 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 operating at the level I'm operating at, which is like you know like a nobody from nowhere with no money. It was like holy shit. Can I say shit on the podcast? Absolutely, that, we encourage okay. that shit. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. Fuck yeah, uh, it was can. like ho- it was like holy shit, like film threat. Like it was it was like it, that sh- that you know to me was like you know like a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The film threat liked my movie. Well, it's just just so you know, like this is how we've discovered. I mean, oddly enough, even Rich, <laughs> this true story in like 1988, 1989, Richard Linklater sent me a VHS tape of Slacker. It, his well, mm-hmm. it was actually his second feature, and he sent it to Film Threat because he used to read it in Austin. And this is how we would find out about these movies. It wasn't from some publicist that you're paying five grand a month to to you know help promote your movie, um, who has the connections and the relationships. It's random filmmakers. That's how we discover stuff. And right. Actually, I mean, that, yeah. 
it's very it's a very punk rock attitude and that's i think what always attracted me to film threat in the first place that it, that it it's sort of had this like whole you know we're going a little bit outside the hollywood thing and and you know we appreciate diy stuff and uh i, I mean because i just remember like the stuff in you know when I was in college like you know like seeing like necromantic and stuff like that like it was really inspiring to me uh because you know i read it in the pages of film threat well, it's it's. I mean, first of all, thank you for all the kind words about Film Threat, but that's not why we're here. That's not why we're on the show right now. We're here to talk about <laughs> your. F- no, but I appreciate it. I, I appreciate. It. I hope that like by because the thing, one thing I, I've definitely learned in doing this and seeing so many films is that you you know money is not a barometer of quality. You know, it, it just isn't. I mean, I, I would just say Michael Bay's career is a, a proof of that. Uh, you spend a lot of money doesn't mean you're going to make a good movie. It's really the creative and driving force. Um, people like yourself who are like also very punk rock and DIY. It's the kind of film that I respond to. It's, it's, um, it's, it's like trauma, but with d- even deeper layers. You know what I mean? There's more going on in this. So, so um, I, I appreciate the kind words, but I got to say, I mean, that's like part of the joy of doing, doing this is being able to discover films like the Theta Girl, which, I mean, you and I have have joked about like it feels like a movie that was made thirty years ago. You know what I mean? Like it's got that sort of like exploitation. It was made in the seventies or the eighties. Like it just like it's sort of out of time. You know? It, and right. And that, and it, so it's like you got to tell me like where this all came from. I mean, it wasn't just because you read Film Threat in college and you wanted to get reviewed in it. You 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 clearly you know your horror so so what was the genesis of the idea behind the theta girl well it, you know it all comes from just the things that i love and you know and, you know we all have things that we gravitate to and you know sort of my thing is is 1975 to 1985 i, I think it was the just the greatest decade for for everything really uh the a film and music and 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 art and graphics and everything. But um, so most of what I'm drawing from is sort of from that era, but definitely like low budget horror and, and exploitation movies. Uh, just for some reason, I've always gravitated towards that. And so I knew that whenever I was going to make a film, it was it was going to be informed by just all the things that, that I love. And you, you really can't avoid that. Mm-hmm. And so, so I wanted the Theta Girl to sort of exist um, – in any time in any place and so i knew that it would be like this could ha- have happened like any time between like 1975 and today and i didn't want to like date it i mean there's things that date it like somebody has a cell phone in a scene you know so it's obviously not in the 80s but you know it, it just sort of exists in another world that's like all the subcultures of those time periods everything that i thought was cool from the 70s to now is just sort of like a part of that world well, I, I, I would have to uh, disagree with you on the one thing. That person with the cell phone could have been from the future. <laughs> that, well, the, that's true. That person for, could have been from the future. And you could even type up a thing, this fan theory about the Theta girl will blow your mind. And someone, <laughs> right. there's going to be some fan on the internet that has a theory of, well, actually, the film takes place in 1975, and the person with the cell phone, they're from the future. I'm, look, that, I mean, you could argue that. We've seen well, plenty you, of articles like that. <laughs> right. They're all and, over and you know the what? Yeah. I, I would never disagree with anybody's hypothesis on that either. It's just like, well, if that's what you think, then you know, go with that. I, I, su- I support your theories. Well, here's, here's the amazing thing. First of all, you should know that this, it's in the genre, in the realm of exploitation, right? Because the blood and gore in this film is beyond. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's horrifying. Some nasty, nasty shit happens. In addition, there's full frontal nudity and just some crazy shit in that realm. And we're not just talking full frontal nudity of women. There, I mean, you see some guys' dongs. Is well, yeah, we we try to be equal opportunity with that for sure. <laughs> I think it's important um, with nudity. It's like, look, let's let's uh, satisfy all genders, all persuasions. I right. Think, I mean, no, seriously. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the 21st century, you know, and we need to get with it and, and you know, give one for the, the ladies or the, the men that, that are of that persuasion as well. 
um, it, it, it's it's funny, like you bringing that up about like the the violence and the nudity and everything. Um, exploitation films. Uh, so I was a huge horror fan when I was a kid, and uh, I, like everything for me was horror. You know, Fangoria subscription, everything, and. So I went to the video store back in the days of VHS, and there was a, a movie in the horror section that I think was you know misfiled uh, called Ilsa She Wolf of the SS. I, I'm, and so I'm, I'm well familiar with that film. So yes, I, mean, I also worked at a video store, so I know that movie. Yes. yes. So so I, and I was way too young to be seeing this movie at all, but you know I rented this film, and um, so it was really kind of like the first like like true exploitation movie that I saw as a kid. And, um, and it probably a lot of it had to do with, you know, like there's naked women, you know, they're, you know, really hot, uh, and, and being at that age where, uh, that's a very exciting thing. But, um, but I became obsessed with this movie and that sort of led me down this path. But the thing that is, as I got a little bit older and went into college and started thinking more about film, the thing that really struck me about Ilsa Shewolf of the SS was that every five minutes in that film, there's either nudity violence or just something really crazy and fucked up happens and it it just seemed like such a perfect formula that that you wouldn't have more than five minutes go by without like something insane happening and so i knew that if i ever made a movie that was going to be the formula it was it's the Elsa formula that is okay first of all that is that is an amazing template for success i mean really I'm, i'm trying to think thinking back to your film and it's like you're right. There's like not like five, 10 minutes goes by and there's not some just one of those like, ah, uh, uh, kind of moments, right. you know, I mean, right. that, I mean, so, that in a good way, actually. So, I mean, so yeah, way. when, when, um, the script writer and I, we first decided we wanted to make a film at all. That was the thing I told him. I was like, I was like, okay, like write the script and, and these are some of the things we should have in it. But mainly overall, like every five pages, you know, cause a page is, is theoretically a minute a film there has to be like nudity or gore or you know violence or just something insane happens and and so that's the script that we got and and that's you know how we approach making the movie but it's not just it's not just violence or gore it's sort of done in a punk rock way and in some of the the, the scenes i don't want to give too much away there's stuff that you just have never seen before and there's also punk rock in the sense of i mean there's bands in in the film like can you tell me about that the uh, the the band at least at the one bar i remember that scene right yeah well i mean you know my background is punk rock and everything that i know about making a movie which is nothing uh comes from punk rock and just the whole idea of you know number one like you're doing it for the fun of doing it and to create something and not trying to do it to, you know, make a bunch of money. Uh, but then moreover, the idea that uh, you don't have to have like a lot of like technical gear. Uh, you don't have to have like a lot of knowledge going into it as, as far as, you know, well, with punk rock, you don't have to have a lot of songwriting knowledge, you know, like you just learn like a couple chords and you can write a song and you can r- record it cheaply and then you can put it out yourself. So I applied all that towards, you know, making a movie because that's where I came from. You know, uh, booking my own shows, like putting out records, uh, putting out fanzines. You know, doing all this stuff. It just so happens that now technology has allowed us to be able to make a film for relatively cheaply. Um, so, you know, applying the punk rock ethos to that, we're able to to you know do a film like for you know the price of a car or a used car. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be polished if you have creativity on your side. Right. And, and I think when you're doing stuff at this level, uh, you know, it helps that you're, that you're trying to do something that's not like Hollywood movies. Like if we had tried to make a superhero movie or if we tried to – I mean, even like staying in the horror genre, if we tried to make Friday the 13th over again, like it, it would be – awful there's there'd be no point to having it because that's already been done better for more money so you kind of have to like go a little bit out like you stay in the genre because you know horror fans are are really loyal and horror fans will watch you know really low budget stuff with terrible acting uh they're they're just they're good about that um but you don't want to like make the same movie over and over again that hollywood's already made for a lot of money but uh, this, so, so oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. sorry no no oh, i was gonna ask you about like but there's things that happen in this movie. I don't know how you convinced 
some of the actors to put themselves in these situations. I mean, it was, I don't know, maybe it's fun. Like, wh- wh- how did you recruit he asked the- them really nicely, Chris? <laughs> how did you recruit this cast <laughs> He's and very put, polite. put them in these situations? Well, you know, I think that's a punk rock thing, too, because we live in a small town where there's nothing going on. And, and I mean, so the best punk rock has always come from like the small town where nothing's happening. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's like, Hey, like, like you're not doing anything. Like, let's do this thing. It'll be fun and cool. And so everybody just is super gung ho about it. They're not jaded. You know, they're not like, you know, like if we try to make this movie in LA or New York, like there'd be these like jaded actors that, you know, think that they're better than that. And it's like, Hey, like I'll give you 50 bucks. Cause we've paid everybody 50 bucks a day. Uh, that's an important thing when you're you're an indie filmmaker. Like you you have to pay everybody something, even if it's like nothing, <laughs> like we did. But like but you know, hey, here's fifty bucks. You know, you could be hanging out at a bar tonight, or you get fifty bucks and like, uh, you know, you're gonna get your head caved in with a baseball bat. And so like, what who who you know who wouldn't want to make fifty bucks and have their head caved in with a baseball bat? It is sort of a, it's a it is a weird thing like you you know wanting to uh, die on film. Um, it's, it's, it's one of my greatest regrets that I know the guy who directed Sharknado and every time mm-hmm. a new Sharknado, I'd be like, Hey dude, you're going to put me in there and kill me. Didn't, it never happened, but you're right. There is that sort of like, Oh, it'd be cool to see. Cause that's the one thing about death. You don't really get to see your own death. It like, I'm talking well, about like, like in a sort of Zen way, you don't get to see your own death. The only way to do that is on film. What I'm right. saying is I'm encouraging everyone in the audience to fake their own death and or be in a film where you get to die. Isn't that like the whole thing with like, um, you know, with actors that really want the Oscar? It's like you got to d- play a character that dies at the end. Or one with mental disabilities. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, there's that. But, well, um, people, people love that and, and it's a selling point. So so I'm, I'm working on a new project right now and, and so in the project there's, uh, a bunch of characters that are basically neo Nazis, and so not everybody, not every actor in the world like wants to play a neo Nazi. Um, but when I sell it to them, it's like, well, you play a neo Nazi, but like your head gets like you know, like <laughs> smashed in. They're like, oh yeah, and like the and the more gruesome their death is, like they're like, yeah, I definitely want to do that. So you know, it's very easy to sell anything on people when they know they're going to like be killed gruesomely on screen. Like, there's just something really appealing about that. Yes, Nazi punks. Watching them uh, get tortured is is actually entertaining. Well, let's let's talk about also the gore effects. I mean, it's they are pretty. Like you, you mentioned that you really had no filmmaking experience, so with no right. quote professional say filmmaking experience, what did you do? How did you beg, borrow, and steal and pull off all the gore effects? Well, we had uh, two really awesome guys named Jamie and Brandon that also had no experience with this stuff but you know like a lot of people they're like oh i think that would be really cool to get into that and so um we just hooked up with them and we're like okay these are the things we need and they were just like making it up like as they went along and and you know we were making up as we went along too as far as shooting it and and somehow most of it worked out um there's a few things that that got cut that we tried to do that didn't work out at all but um, but for the most part, I think I think most of the gore is is like fairly effective, and it's it it's is just, it is it's just it's just people trying to figure it out. It's also I think like part of it is is not because if if you look at even the original, I hate to bring this up, the original Star Wars, I'm talking about like some of those effects are really bad. It but the way it works is you just cut away before you notice it, right? Like right that so right. I, I kind of feel like that's that's the secret to a good special effect is knowing when to cut. I think that's why also uh, I'm not a fan of digital effects. What I love about your movie is, although actually there are some digital effects in some sense, we should talk about that. Like, but Mm -hmm. the, but I think the problem with digital effects is that because you can just do them, you don't have to cut away. They, they linger long enough where they just don't look, perfect to the eye you know what i mean like right but there's some weird like there are like these weird sort of drug dream sequences that Mm -hmm. are mind-blowing in the film tell me how you pulled those off so that was actually just trying to work around our budget because uh in in the original script there was 
it was sort of described a little bit differently. Um, it, and the way the way those halluc- hallucination scenes were described in the script, I thought was was sort of like what a big budget Hollywood movie would do for a hallucination scene. And I just I knew that like whatever we did digitally was going to look crappy. Like there's just no way it was going to be cool. So I, I sort of tried to reverse engineer it and make these scenes look like as if like a high school class was putting on a play. And, and so when these people go into this uh, hallucination realm, um, it looks like a class play with um, like kind of phony uh, props, like tree props and like clouds hanging from strings and things like that. And um, I think in a way, like it maybe comes off like kind of David Lynch ish and that probably wasn't intentional, but, but David Lynch is a, a huge influence. Um, but so in trying to like compensate for our lack of budget and, and special effects, we just try to make it look hokey. And I think intentionally making it look hokey worked. It, it didn't look hokey. It actually looked in keeping it with the theme. It's actually kind of haunting because I think when you're taking that sort of childlike you know, like it's a school play, but like mixing it with like disturbing imagery. I think it, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I think it, I think it, I don't know. I think it played really well. I think that w- what I'm saying is I think it was a really good choice. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really was, you know, I'm not going to like pretend like it was some kind of brilliant maneuver. It really was born out of trying to like mask the, the fact that we couldn't afford good special effects. So we intentionally made the special effects look cheap but I think in the end it worked. No, it, it, no, it completely worked. Like I say, it, it doesn't come off as laughable. I think that's not the reaction that you're going for. You, you, you know, you definitely want it to be something that's kind of haunting. I think playing against it uh, works. It's weird. It's always like using, I mean, just hearing you talk about the making of the movie, because we've talked before, but this is the first time we've actually talked about the making of the film. Um, it, it's, it's a really about using whatever resources you have right? And just using mm-hmm. it to their full effect. So right. you've got uh, people that for 50 bucks want to get killed. You got, you know, your gore effects that you're, tr- you're just trying to see if it works. Um, I don't know, but I have to say that your cast like really went for it, especially uh, the, the lead, uh, the Theta girl, right? Uh, tell yeah. me, like, where did you find her? We got really lucky with her. Um, she sort of came along at the 11th hour. We had put out casting calls, you know, kind of just on Facebook because we didn't really, we're not really connected to, you know, any kind of film scene or, or any sort of actor scene. So we just, just put out this Facebook casting call and, and we got a bunch of people came in and auditioned and, and we found like a couple people that were like, okay, like they could have done it. And, um, then, uh, Victoria came along. We were about to make the decision. Victoria uh, messaged me on Facebook, and she was like, oh, hey, a friend of mine said that you're looking for actors for this thing. Here's a reel. She sent a reel, and it was really good. And uh, I said, well, um, we're about to make the decision today. Can you can you just come down to my house and, and read some lines? And she said, yeah. And she came down, and she was on time, which <laughs> – was yeah. was really important to me yeah. <laughs> and uh and and she came in and read the lines and it, and it was just amazing it completely blew my mind and i was like do you want to be in this movie and she said yeah so it was it, we just really got lucky it was a, a timing thing and I, I i mean i don't really believe in fate or anything like that but if i did i would say like that was just like a thing that was meant to be and she showed up at the right time well it's 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 weird this is going to be kind of a deep cut and then i'm just saying this for the anyone that would know this is that she has sort of a lung leg quality Lung leg was an actor. Oh, that that's really awesome that you said that because um Richard Kern is a huge, huge influence on me. And uh and I love those those Richard Kern movies that, that she's in. Uh, I do as and, well. Yeah. Yeah. She, she seems like Lung Leg. I mean she could be like a clone of Lung Leg. Like Yeah, a, a lot of people have um compared her to um and man, I'm blanking on the actress's name. Um uh this is a movie called Thriller, or they call her One Eye. Oh, you know this movie? No, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, um, but long- yeah, it was it was a it was a big uh, Tarantino. It's like one of his favorite exploitation movies. But um, but everybody says like, oh, she looks like the girl from Thriller. See, now I got to see that movie 
but but you mentioned you mentioned Richard Kern like yeah like this this has like a, a definitely a Richard Kern underground kind of feel where it's it's uh, I, I don't know and I and I feel like Victoria reminds me of like a lung leg like maybe with with longer hair she's I mean just great choice on the lead that's amazing it's so weird how those kind of like happenstances just occur where some sort of you know, just a good thing will just, the universe will kind of grant you like, like, Oh, well, this person showed up exactly when you needed her. Right. Right. And, and yeah, and again, it's, it's really funny to me that you brought up long leg because, because I know that like subconsciously Richard Kern was like, definitely like in the back of my head with a lot of the stuff that I was doing as far as like the shooting and, and maybe even the casting too. Uh, Cause it's just, you just sort of have these, these influences that you love that sort of like, you know, swim around in the back of your head and they, they kind of come out in some way or another. And I think Richard Kern probably came out in some way or another a little bit in this movie too. Yeah, definitely channeling some, some Richard Kern in there, which is, I, I, I think like just for anybody that knows uh, Richard Kern's work in print as a photographer, and then also his short films and whatnot that he, he made in super eight. Also, he's directed some music videos, um, uh, you know, uh, th- th- that just that style is amazing. It's, it, it's also fantastic that you remember it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like some of my favorite stuff of all time. Yeah. I mean that, uh, wow. Yeah. So now also, I think it's important actually to mention, I don't know that we, we brought this up while we were talking that you're in South Carolina. You're uh, right. I mean, you're so when you keep mentioning the resources and where you are, not a film scene. This is South Carolina, South Carolina, which just narrowly averted a hurricane. Did you? Right. Yeah. I mean, but you you're, you're not you're all safe. Like the hurricane didn't really affect you guys as much or. No, North Carolina got it really bad, but, uh, yeah. but we were we were spared. We, it, like where I live, it, it was just like a light drizzle. Right. It was now, not bad at all. If you were if you were Roger Corman, I remember when there was the San Francisco earthquake. Roger, this is a true story, is Roger Corman sent a crew up to the Bay Area to actually film footage of the destruction to potentially be used in a movie. I'm not sure if that, true, that's true. Yeah, so did Wes Craven. So, yeah, okay, so other people did that. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying, Chris, is that you have an opportunity now to go, get down to North Carolina um, and shoot your, no, don't, I don't know that you yeah. should do that. No, it, I don't no know it's, that you it's, should, you should do that. That's but, funny because 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 there was a part of me that was hoping that would be really bad here because I was like, yeah, I could shoot it. It's gonna be really awesome. I'll put it in the next movie. Yeah, but no, it didn't I happen. mean, you you could. I mean, you kind of like you got to use what you have, right? So like, right. if oh, it's raining, absolutely. it's just raining. If it's not raining, it's just whatever it is. I mean, it's. it's I, I kind of feel like those happy accidents are actually the best thing because it forces you to be creative with whatever resources you have. So, oh, absolutely. Okay, so now you, you finish the Theta Girl, and it's like, how long was it in the making? Like, from, like, c- concept in your brain to, like, you're watching the movie in front of its first uh, audience. Okay, so I think it was a year from the day David and I decided we were going to make a movie. Right. Uh, a, a year from that day, we started shooting, and then we shot for three months, mostly shooting on weekends, and then I think I was editing for another six months after that because I'd, I'd never edited anything before. So there was basically a huge learning curve in learning how to use the software and, and just the process of editing. Uh, so it took me it took me longer than it probably should have. But so, uh, you know, like basically a, a little more than a year and a half. Right. And then we sort of did festival stuff for too long. <laughs> like like that's not a I bad we, thing it's not a bad thing did you did you did the movie change at all from like seeing it with that what was it like to see it in front of that first audience and yeah then how did it yeah change? It, it it did change a lot because because you see you, know, you if you sit there with an audience you see what works and what doesn't work it's like really obvious when the movie's boring and lagging like you don't realize it when you're by yourself in the editing bay but when you sit in a room with like 200 people like and they're looking at their watches you can tell so we ended up editing about 15 minutes out of the movie uh, after the first few months of doing festivals. 
and it works a lot better, like having the 15 minutes edited out. Well, it's weird. Like I had the similar experience where you're watching him, watching your film in front of its first audience. You can feel the energy shift when the audience is either not receptive or you're not getting the reaction you were hoping for, or it's just, it's just dragging. I mean, it's, and the mm-hmm. other thing is, is I think they're there. And th- this is something I've learned is that they're, definitely audiences are really smart. They're ahead of you. They've figured it out. They see where things are going. You really are sort of working to stay ahead of the, ahead of the audience because they're, they're, they've just been so well trained by watching so many movies. Right. Yeah. That's what I learned that you don't have to spell everything out that, that you can, you can pull out huge chunks of the story and they still know what's happening. And, and, and as long as like the chunks you pulled out, like, like are, as long as you're not pulling out the chunks that that are, you know, effective and interesting, then you're you're good because they can they can put the pieces together, uh, and that's I mean that's a thing that probably seasoned professionals already know, but as a first time filmmaker, like a total amateur at all this, like mm-hmm. like I had to learn it, but luckily I was I was able to sit in some audiences and some festivals and learn that just by seeing like other people like sighing and looking at watches. Right, right. Now, what what was the festival run like? What was that, like that whole festival? You said you were on that the festival circuit for too long. I think so. I, I, like in retrospect, I wish we would have tried to like get it out a little bit faster because because at first we did sort of get um like some hype going and and there was like some excitement and anticipation behind it and then I think that window closed a little bit because we waited too long. So, and re- it, like, if I had to do it over again, like, I wouldn't do festivals for, like, a year. I would do them for, like, three months and just, like, build as much hype as possible, like, in those three months and then just, like, get out. Uh, I mean, that's just me. I, maybe other people would, would do it differently. But well, I would, I would um, say I, that I, I like a long festival run because you can actually continue to make changes. You can come up with different marketing spins and then you can, you know, sort of alter your marketing campaign. And then you can also like you can be working on some other thing. And plus it builds anticipation because, you know, festivals, I mean, what's the maximum number of people that can see it at a festival? A couple hundred. So right. the, but there's all these other people hearing about it that can't. So um, but either way, there's no one real right way. You come up with your festival strategy. I think it's kind of like once you get it to a certain point when it's in, then you're just sort of letting go. Right. It's sort of like, right. when are you ready to let go of the project? So. I think for us having done a horror film, it was really important that we um, try and do horror festivals specifically because, mm-hmm. because for us doing festivals, it, you know, it was all about building an audience. Uh, you know, some, some filmmakers will do the festival thing because they're like trying to like, you know, get discovered or whatever. And, 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 and that's fine, you know, for some films and some films will do that and they will like make it for us. Like we're a low budget horror movie. So it was, it was really important for us to just like hit the genre festivals that have fans of the genre. And, and hopefully they like the movie enough that they'll, you know, leave the festival and tell their friends about it, which did happen. Well, uh, I have to say that I have some exciting news. Yep. The news is that the Theta Girl is coming out under the Film Threat Presents label, and it's coming out. It's by the time you're listening to this podcast, it should be out. Yes. And this is okay. This is exciting news. This is the first title that is being put out under the Film Threat Presents label. I am proud to have you be a part of this. And now, what what I want you to do is because I want everyone listening to this podcast to go out and buy the Theta Girl right now. I mean, you can, I assume you can, all, well, you can also rent it, right? You can rent it, but right. you just need to buy it because it's one of those things where it's one of those movies that when I've shown people scenes from the movie, it's like, look, sit down and just watch this for a second. I want to see if you can handle this. So <laughs> for, for those that are on the fence, give us, give us your pitch for the Theta Girl. You're sitting, it's a, it's a Friday night, you're hanging with your buddies, you cracked open a couple of beers, you're like, let's watch something really crazy. Should I buy this movie? Give me the pitch. Well, yeah, of course you should buy it. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I made it. Uh, I mean, it's it's got so much going on. I mean, if, if you like classic horror and exploitation movies, like it's it's got all the gore that you want to see. And it's 
I think it's a little bit off the beaten track. There's there's some things that that go on that you haven't seen before, and um, and there's you're, it's going to leave you with questions. Uh, so you'll have a good conversation afterwards after you had some beers with your friends. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna like wonder like what some of the things meant, and and you'll want to talk about that. And uh, and I also, but I think you know really like if if you uh, are a filmmaker that has never made a film before or made a feature before, uh, or if that's a thing that you wanted to do, I think you will get something out of it just to see like some other people that never made a movie before that like got their shit together and, and did it. Uh, and, and if, and if you rent the, um, if you go on Vimeo and get the, uh, uh, like full download of the movie that has all the extras, uh, or if you get the Blu-ray, um, there's a director's commentary and the entire commentary is just how to make a movie for around 10,000 bucks. And so I, I, and I would hope it's like, it's like the commentary that I wanted to hear before I made a movie. And where, okay. Where can people, where can people buy it? Okay. So it's on Vimeo, um, as, as a rental or, or purchase, uh, you can stream or download. And it's also on Blu-ray on Amazon. And we're hoping to add, some more stuff. We're we're trying to get it as um, streaming on Amazon Prime, but that's been difficult. <laughs> we there's been many well, hoops there's, put in there's, front of us. There's hoops that I mean, I I think when you and I initially talked, like some of the hoops, like having to be rated by the MPAA, um, mm-hmm. and I honestly I don't think you could. It'd be hard to get it down to an R. And I think the thing that is the conceit that makes it the film unique and makes it something that you have to see is the thing that makes it that not an R. I mean, it's forget NC 17. That's no one uses that rating anymore. I mean, it's this, this movie should be released unrated period. End of story. I just don't think it should be an R rated movie. I, I, I think it would, it would be pretty milk toast if it was an R rated film. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing that's best about it is, is the fact that it goes to places that R rated movies will not go to. I mean, if that's not a sell enough, I don't know why you're you stop listening to this podcast, go to Vimeo or Amazon, get the Blu-ray or get the, get the streaming on Vimeo. Just look up the Theta girl. Boom. You'll find it. Buy it now. I'm serious. This is um, this is the kind of I mean look, look this is your film is like the reason I started Film Threat right it's because I knew the premier magazines and the 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 the, the other magazines that I think are just um, you know they're too highbrow I mean like look I like a highbrow documentary or an Oscar film as much as the next person but my palette uh, for watching movies it's broad and uh, that also includes films like. The Theta Girl, trauma movies, uh, Richard Kern, all that stuff. I feel John like John Waters. Have, John Waters. You have to have a balanced diet. You can't just live on mainstream bullshit alone. So I'm so glad that you decided to stick to your guns and not like, you know, do an R-rated version because I think that'd be pointless. I think of that. You know what I think about? I think about that little Chris Bickle who walked into a video store, went to the children's section saw um, someone had misfiled Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS, probably thinking it was some She-Ra movie. <laughs> and little Chris the Bickle... Christmas special. Right. Little Chris Bickle rented Ilsa She-Wolf, She-Wolf of the SS, probably had some feelings and places on, an, on his body he didn't really, wasn't, wasn't really sure about yet, and learned some things. And that movie, to this day, still affects you and inspired, I believe... The making, a, the, your making of the Theta Girl, and change forever the course of your life. Now, if that's not uh, a reason enough to get this movie, I say, I say you have no feelings; you are dead. You have no soul. <laughs> well, yeah, I think you nailed it, and and I think we also come from the same place because I think we both approach things that we, with appreciation for both highbrow and lowbrow. And, and sort of the extremities of highbrow and lowbrow. Yeah. And I, th- and, I, and I think that completely informed what we did with this movie. It's, it's you know, 
we we try to stick to a lot of the tropes of exploitation films, like the lowest of the lowbrow, while subverting some of those tropes. But we also kind of tried to like. I mean, I think it's an art film at the same time. It 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 does have aspects of an art film. That's the see. That's the thing that I think separates it from. As much as I love Troma, I think Troma goes for just cheap laughs sometimes, or. Ron Jeremy in the background of a scene that you don't always need. Uh, I love trauma. I love Uncle Lloyd. But um, but the Theta Girl, definitely it has like some, there's like an ingredient in here that's like, oh no, this is made by a mind that that really knows cinema. Well, you know, I, like I love trauma as well and, and especially Lloyd Kaufman is a, is a huge inspiration. But, but my problem with trauma movies in general is this. It's that... I think there's a little bit too much of a like a wink and like, look how low budget we are. Like like like, look look at what a shitty movie we made. Like like sort of intentionally. And to me, there's a little bit of like inauthenticity with that. Yeah. It, it, like like the, my favorite movies of all time are low budget movies that tried really hard. And and they, it, you could tell like like they just didn't have enough money for the right cast or the right special effects, but they were really trying the best they could, and they, and they, they tried to like make a big budget Hollywood movie for very little money, and I think we that's what we tried to do. Like we there was no point in this where we were like try to play it for laughs. Like look how low budget we are. Like look look at what a B movie we are. Like we knew that it was going to come across kind of hokey. Uh, in some parts because of our lack of funds, but we were tr- still trying to like make that like Hollywood movie. Yeah. But I don't think you're laughing at any of the parts because how cheap it is. I mean, I find myself doing that at trauma movies. That's part of the fun. I guess my big problem with trauma movies also is the fact that they always happened in, in Tromaville or just outside Tromaville and everything is named <laughs> right. Troma. It's the Troma fire right. department. I love it's, that. It's the Troma PD. It's the trauma trauma high school. It's I mean it's the the oh maybe the overuse of trauma. But you know I'm a guy that like film thread is all over. It's plastered over everything that we're doing. But you know we we want to give we want to um, cover we want to cover the stuff that is you know I guess we should cover it because it's opening on three thousand theaters. We also want to give legitimacy to um, an area of cinema that doesn't get attention from the mainstream uh, media outlets. So, right. Yeah. So th- th- again, thank you. If you were here, I would knight you. I would <laughs> knight you. I would put, I would hand you an award. I would give you a medal. I would give you the bloody purple hearts. I'd give you a high five, <laughs> maybe a respectable handshake. Yeah. A high five. I, 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 yeah. I would take that handshake. All right. So, so this message to everybody go out, go to Vimeo.com, get the Theta Girl. Go to Amazon.com, look it up. And also you can go to FilmThreat.com, look up The Theta Girl. There'll be links there that you'll be able to click and, and purchase the movie. Um, Chris uh, Bickle, where can we find you on social media? Well, I'm on Facebook as Christopher Bickle. Um, I welcome all friend requests. Uh, I'm on Instagram as something. I don't know. Uh, what about The Theta Girl? We can find The Theta Girl on, on, on social the Theta Girl, yeah, you just like search the Theta Girl on Facebook and, and we have a page and we update that every day. All right, Chris, thank you for being on the show. Yes, thank you so much. Let's it's get out. It's a pleasure. Here. All right, let's get out of here. Beg for your life. Our father, our I changed my mind. Shut up. The fuck shut up. There's a whole world we can't see. It's where the human race is headed, and Theta just helps us get there. I have no idea the kind of people you work for. Okay, but they're not killers, Gacy. We are Christ's executioners. All right, shitheads. Truth Foundation's here. The stuff makes people go crazy. God damn it, what the fuck was this for? I
dog at the door. There is no Satan! Shut up about destroying the world. It's not cool. <laughs>